to let you all know this is sort of just an overview of pediatrics, uh, nothing in real detail, and it's from a longer lecture that I have that would probably take two or three hours, so I skipped around and omitted some of the premature care and early newborn care and started off with just some of the diseases we see. Most of these diseases you may have seen if you've been on the field, but if you haven't been in Africa or other places, you won't see some of these in the United States. And then I'm going to give you a little overview of some diseases that we see in the United States, but have kind of disappeared since I started practice, but I've seen more of them than the residents coming out now. So I'm going to start with neonatal tetanus. Uh, neonatal tetanus is uh, described as tetanus in the first 28 days of life. My slide says it's 80% fatal. Uh, that's throughout the world. It's probably 100% fatal in Africa and underdeveloped countries because you have to have infant respirators and most places don't. Uh, this is almost 100% caused by spores entering the umbilicus. And of course, as you know, most deliveries in those areas are fairly unsterile. I've seen tetanus in newborns where they had beautifully sterile conditions all the way through, and the midwife took an old piece of cotton from a table that chickens had put on and tied the cord with it and got tetanus. So it's mostly from contaminated things around the umbilical cord. It is preventable if the mother is immunized. And of course, it usually occurs in babies born at home because we do have, hopefully, sterile conditions in the hospitals. Signs and symptoms are pretty much those that can be with other diseases, which uh, you'll see noted there, sepsis, meningitis, kernictris, status epileptis, all can mimic deadness. But this occurs fairly early, usually within the first two or three days after birth, but it can be a little bit later. Mostly irritability, weakness, baby does become quite rigid, usually has seizures, may be in a position of opisthotinus, and of course certainly can't nurse. The diagnosis is pretty much clinical since we don't really have good culture mediums or other uh, media to uh, diagnose it with. It's pretty obvious once you've seen the first case though. Basically, when you see a baby with tetanus, you want to clean that cord really well because there may be still some tetanus spores in that area, and you want to prevent any additional uh, infection that you can. Uh, if it's available, tetanus immune globulin, it's usually not available. Sometimes it has been. Certainly want to give tetanus antitoxin because that's universally available. Medical treatment used to be penicillin, but uh, Metronidazole is actually a little bit more effective and easier to use. The dose you can see there, and you can look it up most any place, and we do use it for about two weeks. All of these babies need sedation. They're going to be rigid. They can't do anything, and we have to use unusually large doses of seizure medicine. My preference is to start with phenobarbital. I think it's the safest and most effective. Uh, Unfortunately, most people don't agree with me and they start with diazepam. But I like to add diazepam if it's necessary for seizures. But it's pretty short acting and does have more side effects, more apt to make the baby stop breathing if you use too large a dose. So I prefer the phenobarb and then adding diazepam PRN. And of course, they all need oxygen and, and general support. Uh, if none of those things work, uh, if you can get a hold of it, which is difficult in the third world, where the midazolam is quite effective, but you do need special monitoring for that. Uh, for sedation, if you're not controlling seizures with phenobarb and diazepam, you can add chlorpromazine, make sulfate occasionally. And then once the child gets better, if he does, which is hopeful, uh, you want to wean your sedatives slowly. If you stop them too soon, the spasms will increase, and uh, you have to take them, take your time weaning them down. Uh, breast milk, of course, is the best for a newborn, and then you can't suck usually, so it has to be through a nasogastric tube, and you do need a ventilator. These babies will all die without a ventilator. This is a picture of what a baby with neonatal tetanus looks like. The only other thing I know that looks like this would be kernictus, and you get the opisthotinus from that, from uh, high belly rubens, but we don't see that very much, and uh, we do see a lot of tetanus, so this is more likely to be tetanus when you see it. 
tetanus in an older child, uh, actually a lot easier to treat because we do have some adult ventilators we need, but usually you don't need a ventilator with an adult. The basic treatment is the same, uh, again, metronidazole. The cause is usually different, though, uh, since we are worried about the umbilical cord, why it comes in from a puncture wound or other type of invasive accident in a, a contaminated field, and it's very, very prevalent. Once it's found, you want to debreed the wound if you can find it. Sometimes the wound is too small to find, and you don't really even see where it came in, but if it does, you want to debreed it thoroughly because there still may be some tetanus spores there and inject tetanus immune globulin half around the dose and the rest IM if you have it. Uh, as these get better, uh, of course, treatment's the same. You need the phenobarbital, diazepam, and nutritional support. They will need a lot of physical therapy, but you can't do it in the acute phase because it'll just provoke more spasms and more seizures. But once they're over that stage, it may take several months. In fact, it may take as long as a year for them to recover um, their muscular strength, and they need a lot of physical therapy. And even though they've had tetanus, they're not immune, so that they also need complete tetanus immunization to try to prevent them from getting it again. This is a picture of an older child with tetanus. You can see the same sort of position of opiscotinus with the back arched in the neck and the legs. And this child, of course, is unconscious and in spasm. Any questions about tetanus? We'll go on to congenital syphilis. Now, this is something you may think that you won't see, and I thought I'd never see it. I'd never seen it in 36 years in the United States. But once you do see it, the first time you see it, it's pretty hard not to miss. Uh, best way to prevent the serious complications, of course, is to try to pick it up in a newborn, and this is pretty good now because most so mothers in hospitals that are born at least get a test for syphilis, and if it's positive, the baby gets tested, and we can treat them and prevent all the sequelae that you see otherwise. But if the mother is positive and untreated or incompletely treated, the infant serum then needs to be tested. You don't test cord blood because you may get false negatives from that. Uh, the antibodies may not be there. If the infant's test is positive, even if the mother has been treated, uh, the titer of the infant should be lower and should revert to normal over four to six months. If there's any question, it's always safer to treat the baby, but uh, if it has definitely a lower titer, the baby not, may not be actively infected. If you suspect syphilis, you also should do a spinal tap, check the spinal fluid, or do a VDRL, and do x-rays of the long bones because congenital syphilis very often does affect the long bones. Uh, treatment for a newborn can prevent all of the problems entirely, but it does have to be treated for a fairly long time. Uh, the atlases say 10 to 14 days. I go for 14. I would rather be a little more conservative. Uh, penicillin G, cheapest drug available, and it works very, very well. The dose you can see there, 100,000, 150,000 units per kilo daily IV once a day for 10 to 14 days. Oh, you could divide it three times a day at the large dose, but it can be given once a day as well. Uh, if you don't have any IV access and you need to use an IM, uh, dose is 50,000 units per kilo once a day IM. It's a lot of injections uh, in a newborn, though, and I hate to stick the baby with that many needles. If the mother is treated adequately, but it's less than 30 days before delivery, you can give the baby one single dose of long-acting penicillin, benzathine penicillin. As far as the older infant goes, uh, this is a little difficult because once you've missed it at birth and the baby's come in clinically sick, you've got a real problem. The diagnosis may be difficult because you're not going to see it very often and you may not recognize what you're dealing with. But the main thing is that it has a severe desquamating rash over the entire body. And I do have a picture later we'll show you. A uh, baby has wasting, poor feeding, fever. Uh, you may have heard the term snuffles. Uh, 
this really kind of not just a runny nose, but a funny kind of snuffling sound they make. And the bridge of the nose usually are, is a little flat because the bone has been involved as well. And long bone x-rays could show syphilitic involvement. Cerebral spinal fluid will almost always be positive, uh, increased protein cells and a positive VDRL, both blood and spinal fluid. And uh, high pitched cry I didn't notice in the ones I've seen. Uh, treatment, again, is the same as in the newborns, uh, IV penicillin for 14 days. And uh, benzathine penicillin at the end of the course uh, is also recommended. It lasts for another month, actually, in the baby system. You do need to follow this up. Uh, sometimes you'll get a reactive VDRL in the spinal fluid for a long time. If it's still that reactive at six months, you need to retreat. Uh, this is a difficult situation. Hey, Chuck? Yeah. Question. Um, and your experience um, in our affiliate hospitals has the VDRL test been readily accessible to you? Yes, that's been readily accessible. I think every place I've been, that's one of the tests we almost always can get. Right. I've seen a couple Chuck. of small hospitals that don't have a laboratory, but most of them do. Chuck and Louie, they said they had a lot of false positives, but they weren't sure. Do you know? Shouldn't be. That's a fairly straightforward test. They must somehow have not had the right reagents or not a lot of experience in doing it. That's usually a very reliable test. The false positives could be that the mother has transferred passive antibodies, so the baby has a positive test but doesn't have active disease. But the test itself is pretty reliable. Here's a picture of a baby I saw at Kenwick Hospital. And you can see the rash pretty well, I think, on that slide. It's, the whole skin is desquamated. And of course, the, it's kind of pigmented because it's a black baby. You won't see that in a white child. But it desquamates entirely. This baby, again, was rigid. Uh, he wasn't actually having seizures stiff. And he couldn't feed. And we had to feed him intravenously. I don't remember if we put a nasogastric tube down or not, but we did take care of him that way. Uh, here's a picture of when he's been treated. As you can see, the rash now is in a stage of healing. The desquamation is pretty well gone. Uh, the loss of pigment, of course, from the rash, but that'll come back over the next year. But this baby is active now and crying, still a little rigid. He's not completely over it yet. And this is a further picture when he finished his course of treatment. And he's ready for discharge at this point. Actually, he was feeding, and he, he did quite well. Uh, the rash, you can still see the discoloration around it, but the rash itself is gone. And the baby, of course, doesn't have any fever, and he's feeding well now. And uh, we did get a good cure on this one. I haven't seen a lot of it. I've probably only seen about three cases in all my trips. But it's something that you won't see in this country, and uh, you may if you travel to the third world. Uh, the other thing I like to discuss <laughs> seems pretty simple to me because when I started practice, uh, well, I hate to say how long, 58 years ago, we saw a lot of childhood diseases. And every year I would have two or 300 cases of measles. And we had, of course, all the mumps and chicken pox you want to see. And we just got used to thinking, well, well, that's the way life is. You have them. But they were horrible diseases, and a lot of kids died from them. The problem now is the residents coming out from training don't see these diseases because immunizations have pretty well knocked them out. So that when they do get to a third world country where maybe the immunizations aren't that good and you do see these diseases, uh, they're not too familiar with them and they often can be missed. So that I think it's important that somehow residents going out to that area get trained a little bit on some of these sort of simple but childhood diseases that uh, need to be recognized. Uh, smallpox, of course, we don't see anymore because that's been completely eradicated. We do see a little bit of polio still. The World Health Organization has been concentrating on eliminating it, but it hasn't been completely eliminated yet, but there are very few cases. So we do see a lot of measles and some of the other things. And unfortunately, with HIV now, if they get chicken pox, it's almost 100% fatal in an HIV-positive child. So these are serious uh, problems. 
Measles is an acute viral illness, uh, basically fever, cough, and cold, conjunctivitis, papillopapular eruption, and you can often see spots in the mouth. These are in the cheeks, these coplic spots. You don't often see them. They're a little bit pink. Not too hard to see when you have them, but they don't last long. So if you don't see them in the first uh, time you look, you may not get another chance. They usually occur about the third or fourth day of the illness and last a day or so and go away. But it's the only thing you'll ever see those in is measles. There are very serious complications because this child is quite sick. The fever is high. The mucus is very, very thick. They can't cough it out too well. And you get a lot of secondary bacterial infections. Uh, the obvious most common ones being ear infections, pneumonia, and of course a lot of these kids are sick enough to vomit and can get dehydrated and need IV fluids. The encephalitis rate is fairly high, one in a thousand. Uh, when I used to see 500 a year, that now they're going to see an encephalitis every couple of years, and that's usually fatal. If it isn't fatal, at least and severely brain damaged. And of course, the mortality is highest in the immunocompromised. Incubation period is seven to 18 days, but uh, that's what the books say. Uh, I think pretty close to 99 percent. It's just about 14. It's spread airborne by contact from coughing droplets. Starts out like any normal cold. You don't notice the difference in the first few days. But after two or three days, instead of either hanging on or getting better, it gets suddenly worse. Fever rises rapidly to over 40 degrees often. Uh, it'd be 104 or 5 in our Fahrenheit system. And then after the third or the fifth day, then the rash comes out and it becomes obvious, measles. Measles rash doesn't look like any other disease. It's a sort of flat, macular, red rash. It's a little bit rough, maybe slightly raised, but mostly flat. And it starts on the face, goes on the whole body after the first two or three days. Uncomplicated cases of measles, they get well in about seven to ten days. That's in the United States. Uh, entirely different thing in the third world. These kids are immunocompromised even if they don't have HIV. They just don't have good diets and they don't have good immunity to start with. And they pick up the secondary infections easier and the, the mortality rate is pretty high. Uh, there's no specific antibiotic treatment for it. Uh, in this country, most kids get vitamin A in their diet, so they're okay. But in underdeveloped areas, they don't. And that has a lot to do with your immunity, so that everybody with measles uh, in Africa should get uh, a vitamin A injection. Usually one injection is enough, but we do recommend two, one a day for two days. Uh, for under one year, it's 100,000 units. The older, 200,000 units. And that can increase their immunity a little bit. But the only thing is the supportive care. But the problem there is it's very contagious, so if you have one of those in the hospital, you're going to spread it to all the other kids in the ward. So you've got to have some place where you can isolate them. Uh, it's hard to take care of them at home because they're going to have secondary infections that need to be treated. So it is hard to isolate in these hospitals. Siblings, of course, we try to get measles vaccine for as soon as we can. And if you can give it early in the disease, you may either modify or prevent the sibling from coming down to the measles, but it's got to be given pretty quickly or the sibling's already sick. You can also get the sibling's immune globulin if it's available if you can modify or prevent it if you don't have measles vaccine. But especially with HIV patients, they, they should have something because they're going to die from it. Uh, mumps. In this country, we don't even think much about it because usually if you get mumps, you're not that sick. Last a few days, goes away, and that's about all there is to it. The old worries about mumps going down to the testicles and causing sterility really is kind of a myth that uh, it just doesn't happen very often. Uh, it's possible after puberty, but it's pretty rare, and it doesn't result in sterility. They often get meningeal signs. They're quite common, but actually this is a harmless virus, and they go away without treatment, and there are really no complications from that. Uh, bumps meningitis I don't think anybody ever died from, and they all get well. Encephalitis occasionally, that's more serious, but that's pretty rare, and I've never seen it. The mumps affects the uh, parotid gland, which is on the side of the face, just in front of the ear and above the jaw. And it come, they come in with a fairly firm swelling. It can be on one side, can go down on that side, and then come up on the other, or it can be on both sides. 
Uh, the problem really is not the months. The problem is recognizing it. And unfortunately, uh, they don't see a lot of it, and it isn't recognized. I've seen now, I think it's five or six different times I've intercepted a child on the way to the operating room. They thought it was a tumor of some sort, and uh, instead of uh, recognizing that it's mumps, they've got them all ready, uh, sedated and anesthetized and ready to go to surgery, and I've canceled a few surgeries that way. The incubation period is two to three weeks. That's usually a little closer to the three weeks, and again, the treatment is supportive. And Lance, somehow I lost those arrows again. I'll get it to you. Don't know why they disappear. There you go. Okay. German measles or rubella is very, very hard to recognize in the third world. Uh, in a black child, the rash is so faint that you often really don't even see it. And they're often not very sick. They may have no fever or a low-grade fever, might be a little tired. It's a slightly maculopapular rash, but it's very, very faint, and you don't see a lot of it. You do get some enlarged lymph nodes, though. Uh, it's mild. You don't get much in the way of arthritis in children, but you do in adults. And again, not very, very serious. The problem is that if a pregnant woman gets this, then she can have a, a deformed baby at birth. <clears throat> so a real problem with German measles is not the sick child, but it's preventing a pregnant woman from being exposed or, or getting it. And congenital rubella is the real problem. These are quite severe. Uh, they have to be affected in the first trimester pregnancy. After that, it doesn't cause these, but this is when you're getting a rapid development of the nervous system and the heart and all of these things. And you get microcephaly pretty commonly. I suspect probably, Dick, you've seen a few babies with that. Uh, ocular defects, cardiac malformations, deafness, severe retardation. These kids are really, really severely detard, uh, retarded. And it's recommended in all the textbooks as mothers documented to have rubella that the pregnancy be terminated. Uh, this may be a little counter to our religious beliefs, so uh, it always prevent, uh, proposes a problem. Uh, is this an indication for abortion, or are we considering it murder? So that's a tough one to decide, but uh, the baby will be quite severely affected if you do let it go to term. Erythema infectiosum, fifth disease. We used to kind of ignore this. Uh, we used to laugh about it, too, because once it started around, it goes through a whole classroom in school. And these kids would all come in, and they looked like somebody slapped their cheeks at home. We'd think their mother slapped them on the way to school or something like that, because that's the way their cheeks looked. And then you look, you see this little faint, lacy-like rash on the arms and the trunk. And they're not sick. They don't even have fever. They don't feel bad. You don't know it. But it can come and go on and off for you know, two or three weeks, but it does spread through the whole class. But after a number of years, we began to realize it's not quite as innocuous as we thought. Really, we got an aplastic anemia, but I didn't see too much of that. Uh, but the problem, again, is the mother. Uh, if she's pregnant and uh, uh, gets fifth disease from her child while she's pregnancy, she can have fetal high drops and uh, have a stillbirth. And we did identify it finally as a parvovirus. There's no treatment for it, but again, it needs to be uh, Isolated so the pregnant woman doesn't catch it. That's the only real problem with that one. Varicella zoster. Uh, again, we used to kind of ignore it because we couldn't do anything about it. We have a vaccine now, and that's used in this country pretty regularly, so we're not going to see a lot of chickenpox anymore. But prior to vaccines being available, uh, it was so contagious that every time a child got it, anybody had been even in the room with them, they didn't have to be too close to them, would get chicken pox. And it was nice to get it when they were young because it wouldn't get awful sick and they'd be immune then for a lifetime. But the virus, as probably most of you know, does remain in the body like all other viruses do, measles does and all the rest of them, but they don't cause trouble later. But chicken pox does. And after a reasonable time, as we all get older, our immune systems aren't quite as good as they were when we were younger. And uh, the virus sometimes will be reactivated and come out along a nerve root because it's in a latent form along the spinal cord and causes herpes zoster, which can be quite painful and debilitating, especially if it's in a very old person. Now that the vaccine is pretty universal, we may see less and less of this, but I don't know. With a lot of vaccines, when we first have them come out, they look great. 
but 20 or 30 years later, we find out that they uh, begin to wane and, uh, and wear off. And we don't know that until they've been out that long. So it is possible that this vaccine will wear off, and we may see more herpes zoster as a result of the fact that it, uh, that it wears off. I don't know that. It may be a recommendation to give a booster vaccine. Of course, there is a zoster vaccine, too, so that can be used in adults, especially older adults. Trouble with all of these are pretty expensive. Uh, in a child, uh, it actually isn't quite as harmless a disease as we like to think. Uh, we usually just said, oh, you just have chicken box, don't worry about it. But these kids get pretty sick. Uh, they can have a rash in small patches, just a few of them, and that's fine. But some of them will get it over the entire body. I've seen some where they're not an inch of skin that doesn't have chicken box on it. And it's so itchy, and they scratch so much, that secondary hepatitis and other infections are very, very common. Uh, the lesions come out over several days and are all in different stages. Uh, in the olden days, that was the way you could tell it from smallpox, because smallpox looks like chicken box, but it comes all out at the same time. They all look exactly alike. And of course, the child's much sicker. We don't see that one anymore, so we can forget it. The lesions dry and crust and scab over, and you'll often see them in all stages. You'll see some old lesions that are crusted and scabbed over, some fresh ones that are big vesicles, and some little new ones that maybe just tiny papules. And they're all different. But if the child scratches enough, they'll get secondary infection, and then they get a fever and need antibiotics. Uh, itching, you really want to control that itching if you can. Chicken box encephalitis does occur. It's fairly rare, fortunately, because this one does cause some uh, actual damage to brain cells, which is fairly permanent. You can have seizure disorders and other things. It, it doesn't happen very often, but it, it's more older kids uh, than it is in the younger ones. Uh, fetal infection. This is uh, when the mother gets chicken pox while she's carrying the baby. Uh, can lead to some congenital abnormalities to limb scarring or atrophy and sometimes some central nervous system pathology. If the mother gets chicken pox in the last five days for pregnancy, though, the child is born with chicken pox, and that does have about a 30% mortality rate. Uh, treatment is important to prevent secondary infection. And a cool bath is the main thing. I used to tell the mothers just to sit that child in the bath for a week. Cool water, you don't want it ice cold, but cool enough to relieve the itching. And substances in the bath water, Aveeno is the one we always bought in this country, but colloidal oatmeal works just as well. They're just plain oatmeal if you don't have anything else, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper. You try to keep the skin soft. If it gets dry, it gets itchy more. So things like lubriderm or even just plain Vaseline lotions can help. High doses of antihistamines to try to prevent the kid from itching a lot. And we don't want to use the newer antihistamines because we really would like to sedate the child a little bit with something like Benadryl or Clotrimetan. It's uh, more efficient for itching, and the sedation you get for it is good rather than bad. And secondary infections, of course, will need antibiotics. Uh, I worked on anti-staphylococcal antibiotics, uh, which is good because we don't often know whether it's staph or strep, and that'll take care of both. Herpes zoster, less common in children. I've seen it occasionally. Uh, they usually don't get quite as sick as the adults do, and we've already mentioned the cause of it. can be one side or both. The real problem there is the facial form. If it comes out along the around the eye, you can get lesions in the cornea and can have some scarring from it. Uh, acyclovir can help. It's not a cure, and it doesn't work after the third day, so you've got to use it in the first couple of days if you want to get any <clears throat> kind of help. Unfortunately, both chickenpox and herpes virus in an AIDS patient are very, very hard to treat. Uh, the worst case I ever saw was a, a child with AIDS. I've uh, forgotten which place it was. It, it was. I think it was in Zambia, but I'm not sure. But this child didn't have a square millimeter of the skin that wasn't full of uh, lesions. We tried to find places for an IV, and we couldn't find anything. They got the surgeon in, and he couldn't even find any place to do a cut down to get an IV. The child died before we could do too much. But uh, uh, immunocompromised kids with, with chicken box are almost impossible to handle. <clears throat> uh, strep infections. 
uh, again, in the United States or the developed world, it's not too much of a problem anymore because we do do frequent throat cultures. They're available almost everywhere. Uh, we can do them in less than 24 hours, and we can treat strips, and we look for it. And we know that strep throats are the common cause of rheumatic fever, and nephritis is the more serious complications. So that even though the strep throat might go away without treatment, the complications are still there. So that we make a big effort to control strep throats here. But we don't have those cultures available in the third world. And very often, we don't see the patient. In fact, we almost never see the patient with strep throats. If it's got a sore throat, they don't take them to the hospital. They've got to take sometimes two or three days driving and uh, don't have the money for them to to, and by the time they get around to think about it, the sore throat's gone, so they don't get treated. What we do see is the after effect. Tremendous amount of heart disease from strep in Africa, and basically because the strep throats don't get treated. It's 100% preventable if they get 10 days of penicillin or one injection of long-acting penicillin, but they don't get it over there. So we see rheumatic heart disease, and uh, these kids come in often as teenagers in heart failure, not knowing that they had a strep infection before, but it's the only thing that causes it, so we know it had to have been there sometime. Clinically, if they're quite sick and it's classical, it's easy to tell. So it is pretty darn fiery red. The cervical nodes get pretty big. Uh, tonsils may have some exudate on them, but the problem is a lot of them are fairly, fairly asymptomatic. You've got a little bit of a sore throat or almost nothing, and it can disappear in there or two without treatment. Complications still show up, though, and that's where we worry about it. If it's got a scarlet fever rash, then it gives you a clue. A fine, this is sort of the same papery rash we call it. It's uh, just a, a fine rash all over the body. It isn't itchy, but it uh, tips you off that it's a strep infection. Occasionally, when it's severe in the throat, you'll get a retropharyngeal abscess out of this. This is a, a real emergency. It can actually close off uh, the breathing, and if you don't get a, a good surgeon or somebody there to drain that abscess, why, that's, uh, uh, there's some uh, mortality rate from that. Get enough penicillin quickly enough. If you don't have a surgeon, maybe you can get away without it, but uh, you usually need surgery. Uh, 15 to 20 percent of people with positive streps in their throat do not have any symptoms, and we've proven this by long surveys in the strep seasons where we just go ahead and culture everybody in the school and come up with this number that people had no idea they were carrying strep. So it's a, it's a difficult thing to control, but you have to be on the outlook for it. Strep infections also are common causes of skin infections in Pythagora or Pyoderma. Can the infections in any body organ, and uh, a lot of things. Uh, one of the most severe is this necrotizing fasciitis, which uh, uh, can destroy uh, a muscle in a very short length of time. It's a common cause of endocarditis, can cause meningitis and pneumonia. Toxic shock syndrome we think of as a staph infection, but it may be due to strep too, and uh, also can be a cause of adult respiratory distress syndrome. So strep is a universal uh, infection, can cause infection in any part of the body. Hey, Jeff? Yeah. I want to ask you, um, going back, uh, you don't have to go back on the slide, but uh, on a, a slide uh, previously, um, you said that 15 to 20 percent of these children during the winter, um, yes, at the, the very bottom there, um, yeah. they were asymptomatic. Would you do you think that they are just colonized with um, with uh, uh, group A strep or yes. um, yeah. yeah they're just colonized with it so that wouldn't um, those pay, those children would not go on to develop like rheumatic heart disease or well the thing is we don't know okay. we don't know which ones are in the recipient and, and may have caused or causing a subclinical infection but many uh -huh. many are just colonized have no symptoms whatsoever yes sir. But they're spreading it to the other kids in the class, or their siblings. Yes, sir. Uh, the treatment, of course, is nice. Uh, this is one bacteria. It's never learned to become resistant. For getting so many problems today with the resistant bacteria, is with strep is still universally sensitive to penicillin, cheapest and easiest antibiotic to use. One injection of benzapine penicillin is what we use in the third world because trying to get people to take 10 days of penicillin over there is pretty hard. It's cheap enough, but they just don't follow it up. So anytime we have a chance, we'd rather inject them with a benzathine penicillin. We know we've 
going to prevent trouble. Doesn't always prevent the nephritis. It will prevent rheumatic fever, and probably cut down on the incidence of nephritis. But nephritis does occur two to three weeks after a strep infection as well. Fortunately, in children, nephritis is almost 100% self-limiting without side effects, so that uh, we're not quite as concerned about nephritis in children as you are in adults. But uh, again, we'd like to prevent it if we could. But uh, just like we just talked about, uh, Lance, many of these are carriers. They're they're not sick, but they're just uh, carrying the strap, but they're a threat to the rest of the class. If they're allergic to uh, penicillin, clindamycin and the erythromycin are both quite effective, uh, or azithromycin. Uh, and then if you actually have a child who's developed rheumatic fever or comes in with rheumatic heart disease, they need to be prevented from having a secondary infection. If they ever get a second case, uh, it really destroys the heart. So that they need to be prevented, and the best way to prevent them is once a month, given that long-acting shot of benzophine penicillin. And it is recommended now for lifetime. It was recommended for a while up into the 20s or 30s, and now the recommendation is to give it for lifetime. Uh, that uh, prevents the next strep infection from causing more heart disease. Chuck, somebody has said that in, in spite of this continuing strep infections, it seems like there's a natural decrease in rheumatic fever. Is there, is there anything to that other than treatment? I don't think so. Uh, in this country, that's what they say. They're not seeing rheumatic fever anymore, but I think it's because we've treated these streps and we're taking care of them. But I'm seeing it over in Africa, tremendous amount of it. It's the second most common cause of heart disease in, in the third world countries. And I don't think there's ever been a place I haven't seen at least uh, several kids coming in with rheumatic heart disease and acute rheumatic fever. Mm. I don't know the statistics because I'm not a statistician, but I'm still seeing a lot of it. Um, Meningococcemia is one of the things that you really have to call a true medical emergency. And if you ever see or even suspect this one, you've got to jump because you can lose a patient in an hour with this one. Uh, they come in, they're extremely sick, uh, usually. Uh, once in a while, you'll get one that comes in with a mild fever and a rash, and you can go ahead and treat them and get them cured. But most of them are almost in shock when you first see them. It's a sudden onset. It comes on so quickly, you don't have any time to uh, really diagnose it before they're almost already in shock. They come in with fever. It's a pin-tight petechial uh, rash. It looks like a scarlet fever rash. It's hard to tell one from the other unless it's hemorrhagic, and frequently meningococcemic rashes are hemorrhagic. In, in petechial. Uh, but the shock and the vascular collapse are, are what tell you it's meningococcemia. And you don't need to wait for a culture, and if you do, why the culture may come back by the time the kid that time the kid's already dead. Very, very contagious. It's seen in epidemics quite frequently. And uh usually is systemic, although it may be just a bloodstream infection, but meningitis is a secondary infection, it's fairly common with it too. Uh, so that we want to really jump for this one. <laughs> You've got to get IV access quickly. You can't treat this with intramuscular penicillin. You need tremendous doses, and you need to get them in fast. And of course, if you've got somebody, or you can do it yourself, if you can get an IV in there, that's fine. But don't spend much time. If you can't get it in in five or 10 minutes, go ahead and do uh, an intraosseous. Uh, intraosseous puncture is something that Anybody can do once they've seen it once. You don't even have to be a physician. And you just take a large bore needle, and I like to use a 16 if I can, and 18 is as good if I can. You could do it with a 20, but they plug up. But you just take that needle, and then the flat part of the tibia, just below the kneecap, you can put your finger there and feel the flat part, and you can't do any damage there. You just try to press and rotate that needle till you feel it pop into the bone marrow, and you can use that for an IV and put anything into it that you need. One of the simplest things you can do, and you don't need to have a vein if you can't uh, get it any other way. And immediately get them in some normal saline for shock because they're all in shock. Uh, and, of course, they're going to be hypoglycemic, so you want to get some glucose into them. But the main thing is to get those antibiotics in quickly. And it does take massive doses of penicillin. Once you're over the first day, you can relax because these kids are going to die in the first 8 to 12 hours or they're going to live. And once it's over with, they're fine. 
it doesn't take long to treat them. You can cure them and just have seen you probably in 24 hours. Uh, it's recommended to treat for three days, which sounds like kind of a short course, but they do respond, and three days is adequate treatment for it. Uh, I think probably a, even one day is, but I'd go for three. And any other support, of course, you may need, like oxygen and uh, electrolytes and fluids and things of that sort. But the main thing here is the rapidity of treatment. Don't wait. I've seen too many people try to start an IV and they can't get it started, so they go from one arm to the other and to the leg and to the scalp and all these places, and then it's too late. So if you can't get that IV in, remember intraosseous punctures. They're easy to do. We did a lot of them in the cholera epidemic down in Haiti. Uh, I kind of felt a little proud about that when I was the only one to do how to do an intraosseous the first day. By the last day, everybody could do them. But they're really quite easy. So don't ever be afraid to try that if you need an IV in a hurry. Uh, again, it's very, very contagious. It goes around in epidemics. We used to use rifampin for prophylaxis, and there's a dose for that, and that's still fine. It's not always readily available, a little bit expensive. But found out that Cipro works quite well, and now that we've realized we can give Cipro to young children as well as adults, by the adult uh, recommendation 500 for one dose or for kids 250 for one dose, uh, it's good prevention. All you, all you need is good prevention. All you need is one dose. And Cipro is usually pretty readily available everywhere. So that the prevention now is sit going instead of really faint, but if you can. And oh, we still got infectious mono in there. I thought we were beyond there. Okay, infectious mono uh, in America, we think of it just as infectious mono. But over in Africa, we think of it as a precipitation of Burkitt's lymphoma. And we found out that a combination of the Epstein Barr virus with malaria very often sets up a patient for the uh, possibility of coming down with uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. And as usually, you'll get that in history. So that it's just a much more important disease uh, in areas where you see uh, malaria. And it is due to a particular virus. There are a lot of symptoms. It can mimic almost anything. A lot of them are completely asymptomatic. A typical uh, infectious mal, you'll have the sore throat. It looks a little like strep throat. Uh, if you've seen the two and you see the difference, the exudate in the throat is more of a white, cheesy-looking thing, and it looks entirely different from the exudate in strep throats. But if you haven't seen a lot of them, you may not be able to tell one from the other because it does give you an exudate around the tonsils and exudative pharyngitis there. But it gives you a lot more lymphadenopathy, huge cervical nodes. It can have nodes all over the body, spleen and liver can... Uh, Grow, but you can diagnose it on a slide. You don't need to have a laboratory. You can do it yourself. Just to take a blood smear, and if you can find a, a drop of uh, dye to put on there, if you don't have any other dye, you can use gentian violet. You've got that in most every hospital, and it'll stain those cells. And you'll see these atypical lymphocytes, and you can tell. If you can do a complete blood count, of course, you can get a tremendous high number of atypical lymphocytes that look like monocytes on there. You may have a little bit of rash. Amoxicillin is 100%. If you treat a patient with infectious mono, 100% of them will get a rash. Some people get a rash with amoxicillin anyway. That's a small amount, but with infectious mono, it's 100%. Harmless, but uh, you do get that rash. Uh, there are central nervous system complications. Uh, again, usually self-limited. Aseptic meningitis, encephalitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Occasionally, an acranular cytomas, cytosis, uh, cesplenic rupture. I've never seen it, but I guess it's been reported. Myocarditis is fairly common. But the big thing is Burkitt's lymphoma, and we do see that uh, a lot in, in Africa. I don't know any way to prevent that other than uh, just trying to uh, treat the infectious mono as best you can, although we don't have much of a, a treatment for it. And... Let's see. Well, we don't do heterophile antibodies in uh, Africa, but there is a test for it. Steroids will reduce the tonsillar inflammation, and if the child is having trouble swallowing and you need to do that, you can use steroids. It won't cure the disease, but it reduces the uh, uh, throat swelling so that they can swallow better. Uh, I don't think it does much for splenic enlargement or myocarditis, but uh, certainly something you can try. Acyclamira, I think they've given up on. It doesn't, doesn't 
doesn't do anything. Such a variable disease. Sometimes it's asymptomatic. Sometimes if you have an obvious case, it can be over in 10 days, but it can last as long as a year. I've known two or three kids that have missed a whole semester of school when they've gotten an infectious mono. So it can be a long time. And we used to call it the kissing disease. I guess they still do because you can pass it by oral secretions, but it doesn't seem to be as contagious as other things. I, I've seen a few run in families or in people that are kissing each other, but not very often. Uh, polio used to be a pretty harmless disease throughout the rest of the world, but not in the United States. The main reason being that it was very, very common. And it was so common that infants would get it. And when infants get polio, they don't get sick. They get a little bit of diarrhea, lasts a few days, goes away, and then they're immune to polio for the rest of their lives. So we didn't see polio in the third the developing worlds. We saw it over in this country, and when I was a child, we, oh, summer camps were closed and all sorts of things. We had a lot of polio. And that's because we didn't get that exposure when we were babies. We got it when we were older kids or adults, and at that age, there's a tremendous amount of, of, of paralysis from it. Uh, it just doesn't occur in, in the infants. Uh, 90 to 95% of the infections were asymptomatic, which was great. They'd get immune. And... Uh, occasionally in aseptic meningitis, but the paralysis is what happened in the United States, and almost only in the United States. Now, since polio has been cut way, way down, and they don't get that exposure, the ones who do get it in a third world country now are like they used to get it in the United States. They, they get the paralytic form when they're a little older. Paralysis comes on quite rapidly. It's a flaccid paralysis. It's asymptomatic. Uh, sometimes can affect one rim, sometimes can affect both, but uh, and it's avariflexic. Uh, residuary paralysis occurs in 1 to 250. That, I don't know before these statistics came from, I can't remember, I got this a long time ago. I think to me it would seem like it's much more common than that, but that's what I have. Occasional involvement of other areas, cranial nerves, respiratory muscles, and of course, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the old days of the iron lung when we used to have people in that when they had polio. But very often it's not very symptomatic, but 30 to 40 years later, uh, an adult may gradually develop muscle pain and weakness, and I'm not sure how you make that diagnosis, but it has been found out that polio can just last in a fairly harmless stage for 30 or 40 years and uh, still cause uh, problems in older age. Uh, it's in the feces mostly. It's passed by the fecal oral uh, route. And of course, if there's not good hygiene, why well, that's where you're going to get a lot more of it. can be perinatal transmission. Uh, communication that's more contagious for a week, maybe or so, after you get the symptoms. Incubation is very short. comes on quite rapidly. Again, no treatment. Supportive treatment, uh, there used to be all sorts of different things with hot towels and hot baths and all sorts of physical therapy and things of that sort. Fortunately, we don't see much of this in this country with immunizations now, so that's pretty well all in the past, but it's not completely, completely gone, so we should keep that in mind. I probably have only seen one or two cases in Africa. It's not awfully common. Okay, I think that's pretty much talked about those things. Uh, malaria, do we still have a few minutes? Okay. Uh, this is the last one I got in the list, and I think you all probably know malaria. But again, I'll just go over a little bit of it. It's uh, classic symptoms, of course, high fever with chills, sweating, and headache. Paroxysmal fever spikes every 12 to 48 hours. Uh, this is what the books say, and this is what everybody talks about. But boy, the kids I've seen, I don't see any 12 to 48-hour spikes. They get high fevers that come and go any way they seem to like. And they'll come in often with extremely high fevers. Also common to have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, cough, and sort of pains all over. There's a typical look to kids with malaria. And after you've seen the first thousand cases, you don't need any other diagnosis. You, the kid walks in the room and you look at him across the room and say, oh, he's got malaria. They just have that kind of dull look to their eyes and they're lethargic. It's just a look that they have that other kids don't have with fevers. So, hey, Chuck? Yeah. Um, you got a question there from uh, Mary Lou Fisher. 
Okay. Go ahead. Mary Lou? You have a question? Okay. Go ahead there. Uh, so go ahead. I'm not. Can you hear me? Okay. What I was going to say is, going way back to strep, uh, my my three-year-old grandson got strep and was quite asymptomatic, except one thing he developed was sort of an eye tick in which he was blinking his eyes frequently and abnormally. And his pediatrician mm -hmm. told his parents that that's one of the symptoms of a strep throat. I had never heard of that before. Have you? Well, I'll be darned. I never have either. Well, I'll be darned. I never have either. And yeah. what are you oh. doing, Mary Lou? Well, I, I've learned something. I've learned Boston something, Boston too, today. I've learned something. I've learned something, too, today. Yeah, this was in the Boston area, and uh, she's a good pediatrician, uh -huh. and that's one of the reasons why yeah. they took him to the doctor. So, okay. very unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, nothing I've noticed. Maybe I've just missed it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Of course, uh, if a child comes in with just ordinary malaria, he may just look quite sick, but there are very, very serious other manifestations, and a large percentage of these kids will come in either unconscious or having convulsions or certainly a history of convulsions, maybe semi-conscious, delirious, often dehydrated. Uh, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, is a very, very common thing. Cardiac irregularities, supposedly, I haven't seen these, but uh, we still look for them quite much. Malaria can mimic any disease, but uh, once you've seen a bunch of them, why, it's pretty easy to uh, to tell it from some of the other things that cause high fevers. Most serious complication probably is blackwater fever other than cerebral complications. Uh, this basically is just a renal failure with malaria affecting the kidneys. Uh, and the uh, urine, of course, is very, very black. This is from the amount of blood that's been hemolyzed in it. And it's, I think it's the hemolysis of blood that causes the renal failure. Blood pressure may be increased. Uh, of course, you're in shock, it'll go down, but usually increased. And mortality is pretty high when you have black water fever. It's also quite high with cerebral malaria. Uh, both of those forms are the two serious complications we see in malaria other than the hemolysis and the extremely low blood counts. Physical findings, high fever, tachycardia goes with it, often convulsions. The severe anemia is more severe, of course, than with any other disease because the hemolysis is very, very active and they keep hemolyzing even after you started the treatment. So if you have a low hemoglobin when they first come in, uh, but it's not low enough to transfuse, you better repeat that after two or three days because it may drop even after you start the treatment. Uh, the hemolysis, of course, causes jaundice. Splenomegaly is uh, fairly common. It's, a, it's the basic cause of tropical splenomegaly. Sometimes that spleen is all the way down to the iliac crest. Wow. Hepatomegaly at times, but it's the glazed eyes in a stuporous state that uh, to me is quite typical that uh, I diagnose it more on. Of course, there are good smears if you have a good laboratory, but the laboratories are all different. I've never seen two labs that report in the same way. Some labs report a high influence of positive, some are very, very low, and yet I don't know quite why the difference. Complications, hypoglycemia, especially from quinine therapy, that can also knock your blood sugars down, so you have to give quinine with along with dextrose. Ten percent is better, but five percent if you have it. Cardiac arrhythmias, and again, the mortality rate is high with cerebral malaria or black water fever, and they get dehydrated along with it as well. Prevention, uh, I don't know if it's very preventable. We use mosquito nets. We put the insect repellent in them, but that's only when the kids are asleep, and the mosquitoes bite them more before they go to bed. Uh, so you try to prevent our our activities at dusk, but how do you do this with kids in a mud hut in the village? Uh, use of repellent. They don't have repellents. Long uh, clothing. Sometimes they don't even have clothing. So it's pretty hard to control. The only real control is if we could do it, and that's how we got rid of malaria in the United States, was to control the mosquitoes. Uh, back in the days when you could use DDT, we got rid of malaria in this country, pretty much anyway. They still see a few cases in Texas, I think. 
uh, for travelers, the mortality rate is highest in Americans that go to Africa and get it for the first time as an adult. They're not immune, and they get a pretty severe case. Adults in Africa rarely have any trouble because they've had it a dozen times by that time, and they build up a tolerance to it. So you always want to take prophylaxis if you're a short-term person traveling in Africa. If you're a missionary that lives there, it's not practical, so that most of them, after they've gotten their first case or two, stop taking uh, malaria prevention. I've stopped taking it because it bothers my stomach too much. Uh, cause, of course, is the malaria parasite from Anopheles mosquitoes. Only the females bite, and they only come out at night. Uh, falciparum is what we see in Africa and Asia. I haven't spent much time in South America and Latin America. I spent some time there, but we do see the O Valley and Vivex in, in those areas. And they are sensitive to chloroquine there, but their falciparum is resistant, so we have to use other drugs. Uh, malaria is another form of the parasite. You don't see that too often. I don't know if I've ever had that diagnosed. And they've identified a fifth one that I don't remember the name of now, and I haven't seen it, but there are five kinds now instead of four. Congenital malaria, a baby can get it from his mother, so if baby has a fever in the first two or three days of his life, don't think it's always due to sepsis. It can be malaria, too, so you always want to look for that, too. can result in spontaneous abortion or fetal death. Just poor feeding, lethargy, and irritability, but these go with almost any kind of sepsis in a newborn. Still a major cause of mortality. It used to be number one. I think AIDS is number one now, but it's still right up there. Tremendous number of cases and deaths. We're trying to work on a vaccine. It's been unsuccessful. Uh, and uh, right now it's, it's still a, a, a huge problem. Resistance to therapy is becoming quite common. Uh, Falciparum, of course, is universally uh, resistant to chloroquine, but now it's getting pretty allergic to quinine, too, which has been our standard of treatment for the last 20, 30 years. Prophylactic drugs, uh, we're running out of time, so I'll kind of just skip over those. You're probably all familiar with what you can use for prophylaxis, but the treatment now is different. <clears throat> and basically, IV quinine still has been a standard uh, used for seven days. Uh, I usually follow it with a dose of fancidar. Most people don't do that anymore, but uh, I think it keeps the recurrences down. But the big thing is it's getting resistant, and we're needing to use artemether. Artemether uh, is a good drug, but used alone, also resistance develops rapidly, and there are some countries now in Africa that it's illegal to use it alone. It has to be used in combination to prevent that resistance. There are other drugs called lumefantrim and amodiaquin that work quite well along with artemether, and there are some various preparations known as coartin or falcinon that we use now. And This is almost 100% first-line therapy now. If they're quite sick and need IV, we still use the quinine. But uh, the artemether with lumefantrim is probably your drug of, of choice. And I think that's probably about it. Anemia, oh, I didn't mention the anemia. These people come in sometimes with a two-gram hemoglobin, and they do need transfusion. Most of these kids start out being anemic, and they're adapted to anemia, too, so you don't have to transfuse them as quickly as you transfuse a child in America with a hemoglobin of four. They often can tolerate it pretty well, but if it's four or below, we usually will try to transfuse them if we can find the blood. And often they do have a concurrent infection. So if you've got a clinically sick child with malaria, you might have to cover them with antibiotics or do a spinal tap and be sure you're not having an associated uh, meningitis. Mm -hmm. Immunization is kind of skip to the I think. Oh. Okay, uh, I think I've run over time already. Any other well, questions? Um, let me start off by saying, uh, Chuck, that was uh, a fabulous uh, overview of uh, very common uh, infectious illnesses that we'll encounter in the uh, pediatric population.